Welcome to the Michael Mercy YouTube channel, an 80s nostalgia channel for adults to revisit the golden age of heroes. This is not a children's channel. Kids under the age of 13 should only watch these videos with their parents. Nerd must stay. Nobody beats G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe, rolling thunder, machine gun cannon and a rocket tower, rolling thunder is an awesome power. Joes, welcome to another Patreon special missions request. Oh boy, do you hear that? As the thunder rolls, this one is courtesy of Matthew Craps, who I talked to on Toy Guys Talking a while back. And Matthew is a go big or go home type of guy. He is a proud owner of the G.I. Joe Defiant, and he requested the G.I. Joe Rolling Thunder. Thunder and this thing is incredible. Every time I see it, it's kind of like the USS Flag. It's like a slightly smaller uh, version of the USS Flag uh, feeling for me, but having never had this when I was young, um, and I only picked it up in, in recent years. Um, I had one years ago, which was in not great shape missing quite a bit and I unloaded it and then I regretted it ever since so I was able to pick this one up a few months ago for a really incredible price and the reason it was such a great price is because of the things it was missing and of the thing that it included the things that it was missing were a bunch of the missiles which I was able to get for pretty cheap on eBay so that wasn't a big deal the thing that was included, which I think also contributed in the very low price, was grime and dust. This thing uh, was extremely filthy, very well used, well played with by the previous owner. Uh, it wasn't just uh, simple dust that you could just blow off and, uh, and be done with it. It took me an entire morning to clean this thing off, so now it is once again in nice clean condition uh, and it was fun too um, I enjoy restoring my toys I, I consider that part of the the playing aspect of playing with vintage toys being able to wash them and restore them so uh, I just used some cloths soft cloths and warm water no soap because I find that with uh, soap soapy water sometimes I get spots all over the plastic so just warm water uh, rubbing it on using a brush to get all of the dust off uh, several attempts over and over again uh, sometimes you have to wash it twice or three times the same spot because this is we're talking 30 years of dust and grime caked in and what I have learned about the rolling thunder is that it's not just about dust collecting on the rolling thunder um, this is one of the, the dirtiest, dustiest toys that I've ever had to clean. Um, not just because of the dust surface. There is a lot of surface for dust to collect on here. But we're also talking about dust inside the Rolling Thunder. So there was a lot of dust in all the nooks and crannies. There's this opening gap right here for um, drivers, which you can't seal off. And also... The entire middle compartment opens up to reveal the massive silo rockets, twin silo rockets, and that is another area where if it was just sitting out open like that over the years, we'll just collect tons of dust. And the Rolling Thunder has the honor of being the only toy I have ever had to use a vacuum cleaner on. Every other toy I've just been able to rub the dust off wash it off but this guy when i opened up the silo compartment had so much dust in there dirt grime i actually took a vacuum cleaner to it so now that it's in nice tip top condition let's take a look at some of the amazing play features of the rolling thunder and the one thing that i uh really like about this one i don't know if this is intentional or not but i like the sound that this thing makes it's got these squealing wheels, which just seem very fitting for a V8 
vehicle this big. So even though it's uh, it doesn't have like electronic uh, lights and sounds, um, it's cool that it does make some sort of sound. And maybe it's just the massive weight of the thing. It is it is a heavy beast. We're talking like Fortress Maximus uh, level of weight to this thing. And I like that it actually screeches and screams as it rolls towards Cobra. Rolling Thunder was released in 1988 and it included one figure. Uh, would have been cool if it actually included more than one figure. I think for giant sets like this, like the Mobile Command Center, uh, the G.I. Joe General, even the USS Flag, they could have done two figures and they did for the Defiant. Um, especially since there's two driving compartments at the front, but uh, this particular figure, uh, one figure was included with the Rolling Thunder, and that is good old Armadillo? At least that's the official code name that he was given. And to be honest, one of the things that got me out of G.I. Joe in the later years uh, seemed to be the lack of attention to detail. One of the things that got me into G.I. Joe was the attention to detail. And then it seemed in later years, um, the people who took over the team weren't adhering to the um, certain established continuity, changing the hair color of certain characters. Naming this guy Armadillo, even though I didn't have this back in the day, I remember that I didn't like it because this is a G.I. Joe Armadillo, or at least the 25th anniversary of one. And um, I didn't like the reuse of code names in G.I. Joe. So um, that was one of the things I thought, can't you just come up with a new name for him? And that's kind of the business aspect of it dropping in, having to reuse a trademark. Um, but interestingly enough, this guy does appear in the comics along with the Rolling Thunder, first appearing in issue 80, and he's called Rumbler in the comic book, which is a little odd for longtime Joe fans because Rumbler was the code name of the Crossfire Driver, which was released in 1987. So that sometimes would happen in the comics. A character would come out or a vehicle would come out and it would be called the concept name instead of the actual production name. Uh, I do think that Rumbler is a more fitting code name for this guy just because of the vehicle that he drives. This vehicle uh, brings the thunder. It's aptly named. So, I don't know, I guess after learning that his uh, code name is Rumbler in the comic book, and because I don't have Rumbler, the figure, uh, I think I prefer the name uh, Rumbler for him more than Armadillo, because for me, this is an Armadillo right here. And it's kind of weird to have Armadillo driving an Armadillo. So uh, pretty basic figure. Um, he doesn't really need all that much going on with him since he does have this uh, behemoth of a vehicle that is just armed to the teeth. Uh, if you've seen the new A-Team movie with Liam Neeson, the phrase overkill is underrated, my friend, <laughs> comes to mind because the Rolling Thunder is guns and guns and missiles and missiles and when we get into the missile silos, it's missiles in missiles. So I actually like how he contrasts with the vehicle. He's a plain looking figure. He doesn't actually have any weapons. There's no um, gun holster or knife. I uh, love his boots. He's, uh, he's kind of got those Jack Burton boots. You know what old Armadillo says. Who? Armadillo, me. Uh, plain, like really loud pants, but when you're driving the Rolling Thunder, you can wear any pants you want. And I like the belt, belt buckle too. Hook him horns. He's got, it looks like a, like a steer skull or a, some sort of bull belt buckle on there. He's got the Storm Shadow wrappings on his forearms. You almost wonder if he's, he's got the Arashikage symbol under there like the original Cobra Ninja did. And uh, no uh, like proper jacket or shirt. He's just wearing a tank top here. Uh, showing off his muscles and a helmet which is not removable. So Armadillo 
had no accessories whatsoever, no weapons, no backpacks, nothing, not even a little baton or anything like that. Um, but I think uh, he really doesn't need anything. Guys like him, uh, long range, Admiral Keel Hall, um, their accessory is the vehicle. And when you go all out, like with the Rolling Thunder, uh, that doesn't bother me at all. Uh, and it's actually even kind of nice too that he doesn't have uh, a pesky little tiny accessory that gets lost. And so you see a lot of 99% uh, complete Rolling Thunders for sale. Uh, I, I, I like that he didn't come with anything other than just the figure himself. All right, let's take a look at his file card. Codename, Armadillo. G.I. Joe Rolling Thunder Driver. File name, Make Peace. Philo R. One thing you're certainly going to do in the Rolling Thunder is make peace with the enemy. Grade E7, he's a sergeant first class. Birthplace is Fort Huachua, Arizona. Primary military specialty is armored assault vehicle driver and secondary military specialty is advanced reconnaissance. And the bio reads, Armadillo is in command of the most heavily armed assault vehicle in the world, the Rolling Thunder. He's the most reliable driver in the whole G.I. Joe motor pool. Armadillo is versed in all the latest land assault technologies and his experience as a vehicle driver is second to none. When it came time to select a driver for the most formidable attack craft, Armadillo was a shoe in for the job. And the quote reads, Armadillo is no fun to ride with. You put him behind the wheel of anything with big tires and he just plain loses his sense of humor. His only concern becomes accomplishing his objective and getting to his destination. He used to make good time driving big rigs, but he just left too many people pulled over to the side of the interstate with their teeth rattling. Nobody complains about the way he drives the rolling thunder. He gets you there, right? So that's the driver of the Rolling Thunder, and now let's take a look at the vehicle itself. And even though this vehicle never appeared on the G.I. Joe Sunbow animated series, which was done by 1987 with the movie, uh, it does look very similar to a giant armored vehicle that appears in a two-parter of G.I. Joe. That episode has a bunch of crystals that need to be transported and they are very fragile and very, very explosive. And uh, they are hauled around in a custom ATV, which uh, is very similar to the Rolling Thunder. And I remember the first time I saw the Rolling Thunder on shelves, I thought, is that the, the big ATV um, from Captives of Cobra? And because we couldn't just go and pop in a DVD or look it up on YouTube or streaming. Um, for a while there, I thought that the Rolling Thunder was actually the Captives of Cobra um, crystal transport vehicle that they finally uh, released in toy form, except for a few changes. Uh, now the Captives of Cobra vehicle, uh, it has two ends to it. It can be driven from either end and uh, I figured, well, they've sort of tweaked that design, but you could, I guess, sort of drive the Rolling Thunder from either end. There's two spots in the front for two drivers, and uh, you could, I guess, if, if you want to in your own imagination, say that these two guys uh, could drive the Rolling Thunder backwards, too. This vehicle has so much weaponry on it, it is completely insane. And I think that I have showcased this thing empty long enough. Um, part of the real magic of this thing is when you fill it up with several figures. It looks so bare with just armadillo in there. And the figures that I actually prefer to fill this up with are the uh, original uh, 82, or in my case, the 83 swivel arm versions of the G.I. Joes. And this is something I didn't notice until just recently. Um, being a 1988 vehicle, I had always just put some of the later Joes in this thing and never really liked how it looked. And then one day, uh, I tried the original Joes and it looked so perfect. And that's when I realized this thing is the same color 
as some of the year one G.I. Joe vehicles. It is the exact same color as the Vamp, which um, to me, even though it's an 88 vehicle, kind of makes it feel like the last 82 vehicle, like the ultimate 82 vehicle, uh, even though it, it came so much later in the line. So I'm going to fill this thing up right now with a bunch of 82 Joes, just to show you how well color coordinated they are. It's not just about this green that matches Zap uh, and Steeler and Stalker, but even the darker greens on the Rolling Thunder go perfectly with uh, like Grand Slam here, Rock and Roll. It's just the perfect color scheme for the original Joes and when I was trying the later Joes, who are all very colorful, uh, they got bright oranges on them and uh, blues, bright reds. Um, it just seems to clash and distract from the Rolling Thunder. Makes it look like a hodgepodge and a mishmash. But when you fill it up with these original Joes, I, I think they're just perfectly color coordinated for it. So let's uh, start filling this thing up we're gonna grab Steeler here and it makes sense for Steeler to be one of the drivers of this thing and here's a look at the interior I love when vehicles have a place for drivers to hold on to they they don't have to fit right into the hand but as long as the hand is resting on something like this like a throttle a gear a clutch a shifter something like that that makes a huge difference uh, the Rolling Thunder also does have these seat belts, so no uh, pegs that plug into the backs, which is fantastic for modern figures. Modern figures will fit in this thing perfectly, uh, but um, the drawback is these seat belts really, really suck. Uh, same type of seat belt that's in the Phantom X19. They're kind of tricky to get in there to tighten um, it's nice that there's no uh, back peg there because if there was a lot of the modern figures wouldn't be able to fit properly but I just don't like the seat belts I guess it's nice that it holds them in place um, but there you go there is a uh, Steeler in the Rolling Thunder how perfect does that look perfectly color coordinated with the outside of the Rolling Thunder and both sides uh, of the front have these canopies that have this little nub right here which uh, gives you a spot to hold on to lift it up and it's nice that they do stay up when you open them up kind of slightly clicks into place so that you can play around in there and then they easily shut to uh, it's the same on the other side with armadillo, same type of seat, places to hold on to, same type of thing right there. Uh, you've got a machine gun up here, which swivels 360, and that's not enough. It's got a little pivoting radar dish on top of it too, overkill. If it's not weapons on weapons, that it then it's surveillance equipment on weapons. So that's really cool. And then the front of the Rolling Thunder has this huge cannon on it, which has some range to it. It goes up and down, and it can swivel left and right. So you can't attack this thing from the front, from the sides, from the back, from above. It is not just a giant uh, rolling personnel car carrier. This is this is uh, a huge, huge attack vehicle that can attack you from all sides. Underneath on the sides, there are two missiles. The way I like to arrange them is um, the two pointing forward. And then there is a identical missile, single missile on the back here. And I like to point it that way because that part of the Rolling Thunder defends the front part. This part defends the back part. So it makes sense if it was being followed by uh, by 
uh, Cobra tanks, then it would be able to shoot backwards as well. So you have those missiles on both sides. And then you've got these uh, rotating machine gun turrets, four of them. And those also have seat belts on them to place the gunners in. So naturally one of the gunners that we'll select for these turrets is good old rock and roll. For the vintage figures, a peg would have been nice to hold them into place, but then that would mean these would not work with modern figures. And you can feed that seat belt right through to the other side. And then there's a little gap right there that you can pull the seat belt through. And then it has little handles on either side. So instead of feeding the figure's hand through it, you're just asking to break pegs that way. Uh, I just like to rest the hand on top. And the gun can move up or down. It has quite a bit of range to it. And it's a full 360 on the turret as well. And if you're not too good at placing figures in the turret while it's attached to the Rolling Thunder, it's actually very easy to just lift it off and uh, plug it back in that way, make it a little bit easier. So we've got three turrets to go. How about another heavy hitter? We'll put Zap in this one. Take that off and let's take a peek and see if there's enough space here to keep his backpack on. Um, sort of. What having a backpack on does is it moves the whole figure forward so he's not going to be as able to grab onto the handles so I think you're better off removing any backpacks. And we secure Zap in there as well. Defending the rear and two more guns on the other sides. So let's grab a uh, short fuse, another heavy hitter, guy who's familiar with heavy artillery. And let's take Grunt as well for the final gun. This particular one has a busted seat belt on the back there, which is not a big deal. The figure still sits in there nice and secure. All I gotta do is just push that in there. And uh, someday I'll get myself a replacement seat belt for that, but it doesn't bug me. And uh, I think a Phantom seat belt would work as well. Uh, safety first, put Shorty's visor down, and then the final gun here is for good old Grunt, and these seat belts are a little bit of a pain to work with here, but get him in there. So we've got four gunners on the top of the Rolling Thunder now, and two drivers. And next, we can load up two guys in the back cannon right here. And since they're dealing with a giant laser here, who better to handle that than Flash and Grand Slam. Got your two laser experts in the back handling the lasers and the back turret does rotate 360 degrees although it does get in the way of the turrets, the machine gun turrets a little bit. So that's why I just prefer having it pointing to the back and it is armed with one, two, three huge red missiles. This is what I'm talking about when I say overkill. This is a giant tank cannon. This is the size of like the, the Mauler or the uh, Mobat cannon, even bigger. But that's not enough. We got to put a missile on the cannon 
missiles on missiles, missiles in missiles. This particular one, uh, I think it was supposed to be able to hold its position. This one drops, which I like because if you are uh, simulating firing it, it kind of boom gives a uh, gives it that kind of bounce after you fire it. And one of the most often lost pieces on the Rolling Thunder are the rear antenna, which very easily plug in or, or come out. We are not done though. There are two spots left inside here. There is a, a rear facing, I guess it's, it's another weapons uh, chair, weapons station. And we're gonna take Colonel Hawk who's no slouch when it comes to heavy artillery. Originally came with the uh, MMS, and we're gonna put him back there. And then beside him looks like a communications console. So who better to operate that than everybody's first Joe, or lots of people's first Joe, Breaker. So Breaker, he's got a stand. He's doing the uh, Star Trek action of when this thing is rolling and bouncing around he's going to be bounced around no seat belts holding him in place so that's currently 10 figures and we're not done yet we haven't even looked at the opening feature of the rolling thunder so on top we've got this interesting looking uh turning rocket turret thing and one, two, three, four, five, six little rockets that are removable on this thing right here. And this part opens up here. And it's, once again, sort of gets in the way. You wouldn't want to be this guy when this thing opens up here. Uh, I guess this could remain attached to the doors when they open up. But I think ideally you're supposed to take this off and just set it aside and have it be almost like one of those pack rats. Um, it's too bad that it didn't have some sort of wheels on the bottom of it so it can be movable, remote controlled. But um, that's, that's one of the imagination aspects of it. There's no way to get it down on the ground so you just have to basically pick it up and put it there. But the doors inside open up there. And then we've got these little ramps here that unhinge, open up, and are you kidding me? If all of this stuff wasn't enough already, there is an ATV inside this thing. It's got a vehicle inside this vehicle. And of course, who better to drive than good old Clutch? And inside here, there is a little um, like stick for him to grab onto. And he can also grab onto the uh, turret of this little machine gun. So it's not just a scout vehicle. It's, uh, it's got some weaponry on it too. And it reminds me a lot of Optimus Prime's roller with the six wheels. So that goes in the middle. And unlike this rocket turret, which you have to pick up and then put down I guess you could imagine it's got a jet in it maybe you know boom and it just lands there uh, unlike that the ATV actually has a ramp that it can roll down out of the rolling thunder and off to whatever little recon spot it needs to go so that's it for actual proper places for the uh, figures to sit in but uh, because this part right here, when it opens up, is empty, uh, you could store your final remaining original G.I. Joe's, Scarlet, Stalker, and Snake Eyes. Just uh, have them in there and ready to deploy on foot when the Rolling Thunder makes a stop. So it does have a little bit of storage space in the front there as well as back here by golly uh, if you don't like the idea of laying your figures down they could actually uh, just sit back here 
and there's actually plenty. I don't know how comfortable <laughs> they would be uh, close to such a gigantic missile. No one wants to be uh, sitting right at the head of a, a, a giant warhead, but uh, it's, a, it's an option if you want to store some uh, figures for transport. There is quite a bit of space here, lots of headroom for this thing to close back up. And you might even be able to fit some other weaponry uh, back underneath in there. But here's without a doubt the biggest gimmick of the Rolling Thunder. And it might be the largest weaponry of any original real American hero, G.I. Joe vehicle or playset. Good lord, look at the size of these things. Two giant twin rocket silos that raise up out of the rolling thunder and then secure into place with a little peg right here. Now you would think this would be uh, somewhat terrifying plugging this in and breaking this because if that breaks then this whole structure just doesn't work. It's not secure anymore. But luckily that feels pretty sturdy and not all that fragile. So once that plugs in, we've got this thing right here. I guess you could put another figure maybe with a jump jet pack. That'd be a perfect launching point. But that is just unbelievable. This thing is so huge. It's so long. Uh, when you raise up those missile silos, uh, now instead of just being long, uh, you get so much height to it as well. And when you open the silos up, it opens up tons of space in the back here. So you can put figures here, or uh, you could even fit a Skyhawk in here, or I think there's probably enough space for a vamp. Let's take a look. Yeah, that gives you a really good idea of how much space you've got in behind here once you open up the silo. Most of you know how big a, uh, a vamp is, so a vamp easily, easily fits in here. Tons of space. Uh, and actually fits quite nicely because of the grooves in here from the, from the silos. That just looks fantastic, especially with how well color coordinated it is. And that's a big reason why I feel like the Rolling Thunder is just a perfect complement to all of the 82 G.I. Joe toys. And here's a closer look at those ginormous missile silos. They're both removable. So in order to get them out, this part is a little tricky. Um, Raising and lowering the silos is pretty easy. You just give it a little tug or give it a little push in order to secure it again. Uh, but to get them off, you want to be careful because they attach to the Rolling Thunder with uh, these little pegs right here. This is right here what plugs into this part of the missile silo right here. And that's the part that I always need to be careful with. I'm gonna do a size comparison here to show you just how huge these missile silos are. There's a stalker, a regular three and three quarter inch figure. And these missile silos just go on and on and on. It is crazy how big these things are. So gigantic. And I bet you that it would dwarf a Masterpiece Optimus Prime as well. And it does indeed. It is quite a bit taller than a Masterpiece Optimus Prime second version. And in fact, it's also quite a bit bigger than Fans Toys Grinder third party version of Grimlock. So if you know how huge a Masterpiece scaled Grimlock is, proper Masterpiece scaled Grimlock, these rockets are even bigger than that. 
And in keeping with the theme of overkill, as if these giant rockets weren't enough, one of these looks like it could destroy an entire USS flag. <clears throat> Each rocket is equipped with six cluster bombs inside. So I imagine it would fire, and then while it's in midair, these clear doors would pop off, and then the missile would shoot missiles <laughs> at Cobra. So that's seven targets, six smaller ones and one giant target that can be destroyed by one of these giant missile silos. Uh, and it's even articulated. It's a missile that's so huge it has one point of articulation. The back part actually spins. So if you want, to, while you're flying it through the air, to pretend that it's, it's like a space rocket, you can actually fire it that way too. And a cool little bonus feature for the Canadian version only. I don't believe it was included with the American or any of the other versions is you can insert four double D batteries and there's a little button in here that you push and that will actually launch one of the missile silos. Holy smokes. <coughs> uh, major drawback to that though <coughs> is uh, there doesn't seem to be a pollution filter on those rockets. And to wrap it up, a couple of size comparisons. Here it is alongside the original armadillo, teeny tiny tank. And we also saw the vamp earlier. And here's the big Mobat looking not so big next to the rolling thunder. And here it is beside another huge tank, the mobile command center and the rolling thunder is actually just a little bit taller than the mobile command center and the length is close the mobile command center is actually a little bit longer than the rolling thunder unless you do that and once you do that the rolling thunder is then actually longer than the mobile command center and We'll go tripod free here just to show you the the height of it. Um, this is about level. So yeah, the mobile command center, it has a, like the actual structure is higher, but if we're talking about uh, from top to bottom, uh, the rockets extended upwards uh, do make it a little bit taller than the, uh, mobile command center and interestingly enough it is actually a little taller than the deck of the ultimate USS flag so if you've raised up your USS flag with one of these custom underneath parts and with wheels just to give you an idea of how tall this thing is the rolling thunder is higher than the deck the deck part not the superstructure and then all the uh, stuff on top of the, the antenna. But the silo definitely adds a lot of height to this magnificent vehicle. I want to thank Matthew again for the request and all of the good brothers and sisters supporting the channel over on the Patreon tribe. Big warm welcome goes out to new Patreon tribe members Ryan Quillinen, Christopher Kelly, Linda Crowley, and Anthony Carranza. Thank you for contributing to the channel. And thank you, John Draven, for the extra cheese. If you're in a position to contribute and join the Patreon tribe, visit patreon.com slash michaelmercy and get access to 80 Patreon-exclusive videos like toy reviews, roundtable discussions, and virtual tours of retro toy shows and the Canadian Toys R Us stores. Thanks for watching. Feel free to share with your fellow Joe fans and join the tribe Launch a missile filled with missiles at subscribe. Yo, Joe!